strong Positive mindset A world class foundation For you and me Getting to know Young youths and athletes And talented coaches And so much more Champions in the making No pain, no gain Bringing you levels Bringing you levels to the table Warriors Teaching warriors To another episode of the Dawson Girl Academy Talk Show. Have I got a treat to you, for you today? Um, we have a gentleman as we cover sports, media, and business. And today we have a business guru. The impact of this person, if he was to get things wrong, it would make a dent in the UK economy. He's a gentleman that's been a captain of industries. He works in a, a selective group of high flyers, very successful businesses, and he's got a best of about 100 top prestige business men and women that helps to mold the UK, you know, when it comes to business, of course. And no further ado, because there's so much to talk about, I'd like to introduce or invite to the show, CBE, yes, Justin King. Welcome to the show. Hello, Dawn. Hello, hello. Hello, Justin. Thanks, thanks for having me you on your show. Excellent. I tried to bring like that great guest in the past when it comes to the sports world for people that understand, you know, and people look up to and hopefully that they can learn something and take a few nuggets. And what better person can we have when it comes to business? Um, I mean, Justin, CBE. I mean, on the honours or the birthday, the Queen. How many times have you met the Queen? Uh, I don't know, actually, four or five, probably, in my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. But, you know, well, what I like to do, everybody has a story. I like to go, you know, straight into it. I mean, you've worked for a lot of great brands, um, you know, on an international level. Let's be honest, if there was ever a gold medal presenting for the Olympics in business, I'm sure that you would have achieved one. quite a few, actually, over the years. I mean, you worked for the likes of... Marks and Spencers, uh, Mars, Pepsi Cola International. Um, you work for, you was the CEO of Sainsbury's and a span, I think, of, of 10 years that you've turned it around and you, know, you, you made, I think, over about 2.5 billion. It's 2.5 billion. So give us an insight. What was that like? Well, do you know, Dalton, I thought you'd put the tie on in honour to uh, my time at Saints. It's a nice orange tie yeah, there. You know, my <laughs> yeah, you've been thinking it through. So, yeah, my, look, my background was I, I started out working um, in uh, manufacturing companies that you mentioned. Uh, Mars, I worked for Mars, Pepsi, haagen worked internationally for, uh, for Pepsi. And then I crossed the table, so to speak. I became a retailer. I worked for Asda, Marks and Spencers, and then... Um, in 2004, I became chief executive of, of Sainsbury's, and that was, uh, in many ways, I suppose, the, um, my Olympic gold medal, to put it in, in those terms, becoming a chief executive uh, of a big, what's known as a FTSE 100 company, so one of the biggest 100 companies in the, the UK. Uh, and I did that job for 10 years, and it was a business that was quite broken when I went there. Uh, had uh, historically been uh, very much the number one retailer in the UK, but it had a, a bad run um, really through uh, the 1990s and into the early 2000s. And I like to think that, you know, along with the team that I recruited, uh, we put Sainsbury's back in its uh, rightful place. And I, I, I left Sainsbury's in uh, 2014. We grew the sales nine years in a row and we grew profits nine years in a row. And that's, uh, if you're a chief exec, that's the the clearest measure of your performance. That's my, uh, that's my high jump. That's my 237, uh, if you like. Yeah. So that's great. I mean, the team that we're saying, that is very hard. Man management, woman management. Um, how, how do you handle that? Because obviously for me, it's easy. It's not a team event. It's just about me and the bar. But how do you handle people? Because man management or woman management is politically correct. I want to know how, because obviously you're very seen, cool, calm and collective. So how has it been? Or is that just, you know, 
over years experience of you know how to handle certain situations well it, it is experience uh, over time i mean I, I i often say that you know i'm, I'm the eldest of four boys i was uh, six years old um when my youngest uh, brother alistair was was born and um you know my earliest memories are all of my mum or my dad saying justin you're in charge um so i i kind of like to think that my uh, leadership uh, skills were being honed from a very young age. When you run a very big business like Sainsbury's, 150,000 people or so, uh, of course, leadership has many aspects to it. I mean, you uh, clearly have to connect with 150,000 people, but you can't do that in a way that involves you being in a room with them uh, every day. At the other end of the spectrum, you have a board of about 10 people and most of them you're seeing most working days. So um, it, it requires a, a different approach depending on, you know, if you like, where in the layers of the organisation. But I think the, the constant thread, uh, regardless of whether it's the 150,000 or the 10, is communication. It, it's, um, I know it's a cliche, but that old thing about one mouth and two ears and using them in proportion, spending a lot of time listening to your people, hearing what's going on in the business, and, and you are the ultimate decision maker, but in truth, as a chief exec, um, most decisions never reach you. And if you create the right level of direction, purpose, empowerment in the organisation, uh, most things shouldn't need to get to you. Only the, only the tough stuff, you know, the really tough stuff uh, should get to the, to the top boss because a, a, an organisation running well should be able to take most of the decisions it needs to take um, at the coalface, so to speak. Wow. I mean, I love that because foundation, and that's like me from my family. I mean, I came from Hackney. I knew that you, you was born in Stepney, if I'm right, and yep. moved to um, the Midlands. Just um, off the Marlin Road, I was born. <laughs> that's right. I was born at Hackney Hospital. But for me, it was my family who was very strict. My mum was um, a cook and dad was a carpenter. And just the values that they had that it steered me away from, you know, getting myself seriously into trouble. And the qualities that I've attained and carried on in my, my career. So I love um, when you're saying about your family, you learn at, at home, and that is great. So a lot of people need to listen to your, 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 your parents. Um, the key is what I realize is that in sport, like me, especially my event, I can avoid various people, you know, because it was just me in the bar and jumping. But how? You can't avoid people. So it's a culture, you know, I'm going at a world level, whatever platform I go, I go on there and it's just me entertaining the world. But how do you handle that? You know, that kind of pressure of you're going out there and you might have a difficult person that not, is not pulling their weight, but you see that talent in them. But time is not yeah, on your I, side I, because you have to learn as you're going along, like I mean, so you haven't got time. So it's not a thing that you can wait because the market is growing quick and you're, 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 you're you know, taking on challenges every day and, and, and it's a culture of the beast, you know, success, let's go. Well, part of what I touched on earlier, you know, about communication is um, accessibility. You know, you have to be accessible to your people. One of the things that I was um, uh, quite famous for at Sainsbury's, but it was something I developed in my earlier uh, working life, was that people felt that they could get through to me. Um, you know, obviously um, the world has moved on in terms of you know, electronic communication. Um, in, in my day, a, a telephone call or a letter was still the much more usual way that people would try and get in touch. But um, you know, I made a commitment to the customers of Sainsbury's, to the colleagues that um, uh, worked uh, for me, that if they contacted me directly, they'd hear back from me uh, directly. Um, and um, I actually wrote, my team gave me a little certificate when I left Sainsbury's, I'd written over 11,000 letters in my time at Sainsbury's. When I say I wrote them, I had a team of people that helped me write them. <laughs> Often I was just signing the bottom, but I'd always read the letter before I signed it. And for me, that did two really big things. The first thing is, is it demonstrated that I was accessible, that I was listening. And when it, therefore, it comes to making tough decisions, people can believe that the person at the top understands the consequence of those decisions because they're listening they're connected and secondly it was a rich theme of knowledge you know there, I, there's I can't tell you how many literally hundreds of things I found out about the business that were useful to me in leading the business uh, as a result of that approach but it's a big commitment you know when you're 
as I often was. Um, I lived in the Midlands. My the office was in London. I had a flat in London, and I sort of commuted. But I had young children too, and I tried to get home during the week. I'd often get in the car, leaving the office at five thirty, six o'clock, and go home, read the kids a story, put them to bed, get up at five a.m. the following morning and have a three hour drive uh, back. I was driven, I have to say, I was very privileged. I had someone in the front and I was in the back. But in that time, I would write and sign 200 letters in the back of the car. Um, wow. And you know, my, my workplace finished as I stepped across the threshold into the house or stepped across the threshold of the house into the back of the car. So it's, a, it's, it's hard work. I mean, it, it is hard work and oh. you shouldn't let anyone persuade you otherwise. Yeah, so, I mean, that's great. And that's why, for me, looking at you, it's just me going out there, like I said, and competing, and it's quite, you know, what is challenges and for me, but it's not a problem because I embrace, I embrace the challenge. I try to be bigger than the moment because if you're not bigger than the moment, the moment will suppress you. But the interesting thing is that when you say big, it's actually huge, it's massive. And when you think of the culture of business, you think the culture of people, the area of people, you know, how they spend their money, so you've got all this. So do you take that on board? And um, what it sounds like that you're on ground, because that's like me. I believe that I need to be on the ground to listen to the people, understand the people, feel the people to help them. You know, it's not like your polit political cliche where you think you know, but you don't actually go on the ground to get to know. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I learned that very the first company I worked for after I left university. I was very fortunate, um, uh, much uh, fewer uh, young people got to go to university when I was young uh, than do now. Um, I joined Mars and part of the philosophy at Mars was that you should learn from the ground up. So my first job was working on the Galaxy production line on shifts. Um, and, uh, you know, you learn a lot at three o'clock in the morning when you're really tired and the production line breaks down and there's chocolate firing everywhere. Um, <laughs> and then after I'd done that for six months, I, uh, I uh, had to walk the pavement. So, you know, territory salesman in North London knocking on corner shops trying to sell them Mars bars. And you wow. have this great privilege. You didn't uh, you knew that it was something you were doing for a period of time before the next opportunity came your way but you also understood the, the expectation of the company at least I understood that the expectation of the company was that you should get a lot out of it and you know I, I took that philosophy if you like with me in working life so when I was at Sainsbury's I ring fenced Fridays to be in stores and probably over my 10 years there I was in stores or at a supplier because that's another big part of what uh, supermarkets uh, do if they're successful they engage properly with the suppliers the farmers um, and others, of course, um, every Friday. And there wasn't a Friday where I didn't come back to the office on Monday knowing something extra, something useful, something powerful that I could bring to bear in running the business. So um, staying connected, you know, one of the things I would observe about some leaders, and I understand why this happens, because you can be really weighed down by the scale of the responsibility that you have. They retreat into a bit of a cocoon, a cocoon where they're protected from the world by their assistants and secretaries and um, they no longer answer their own phone or own emails whatever it might be and of course I understand why you do that because you feel under so much pressure but at that moment you're disconnecting yourself from the coal face of the business and, and only one outcome can happen you know eventually you'll be so disconnected that you either you know lose your authority as a leader or you start making decisions which don't properly understand what's going on in the organization so it, it's it's the start of a journey to failure i would uh, argue if you disconnect yourself from the coalface uh, of the business right so it's very interesting you say that but what is interesting is this, uh, a lot of people might think that when you've got young kids and you're trying to be driven because you know what it's like obviously because you've been there and done it and achieve it what is that mindset that single mindset that you need to drive forward so it's interesting that you know you had a young family you're driving down to, to, to London, you've got to make those decisions. And it must be hard for people to live with you because I know what I was like when I was going out there and people have might not have the same mindset that we have, single mindset at the right time to make that right decision. So how do you think, did that help you? How was it, how did you handle that? Because people must be wondering, if I've got a family and I want to still pursue my, my career. Do I sit down and let it go by me or do I, you know, just go with the flow of what's to be, to be, meaning that we have to take the rough with the smooth. So how, how is that 
you know, impacting your life? Well, look, I'm divorced, so um, I'm probably not an authority on this. No, but that's the experience, no... Justin. Just yeah, your experience, there's... and we don't need to go that deep into it, but just you know, little dips and be. Yeah, yeah well, look, there's no doubt that my my job um, was the priority in my life, uh, along with my children. And I think my ex-wife would say that she felt that with my commitment to the job and the children, there wasn't a lot of time for her. And, um, you know, that's a, a harsh truth, which I, I've had to come to terms with it with. Um, I'm pleased to say that she's happy now and I'm happy now. I have two stepchildren in, in their teenage years and my own children are. Uh, in their late uh, 20s. But, you know, you try and strike a balance. You know, I, I, I come from a tight family. My, I still consider three of my best friends, my th three brothers. I, I still see them uh, regularly. We grew up together because we were a very similar age. So, you know, m much of the playing that we did, sport and, uh, and uh, you know, other play was with each other as much as it was with uh, school friends. And, um, you know, for me, a very important part of my life was to try and give my children uh, opportunities. And I wanted to be there and part of them. My, my son uh, took a path which was into sport, in, uh, into motor racing. Uh, there was one uh, year when uh, uh, my, my secretary told me um, when I was following my son's racing and he was racing in Europe around the world that I was abroad with his racing 34 weekends in one year that I was chief executive of St. Bruce. So I managed to combine uh, 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 following and helping and supporting his motorsport with doing my job. But it's fair to say, if you're abroad 34 weekends, your daughter, my, my, my daughter, Bryony, um, and my, my ex-wife didn't see a lot of me that year, it's fair to say. So you try and strike the best balance you can, but uh, sometimes it is a quart into a pint pot. Yeah, well, um, what I can say, hand and heart and the truth, um, I know that um, you did a great job because I do know your son, Jordan. Um, he's came down, it's quite a good... Afri actually, quite, quite, quite nippy. I mean, even though he took up more uh, racing. Um, and he did a great job. I can say that being Thank a parent you. of three boys and one girl, myself. And it's just nice. Thank you for being so open about, you know, the pressures of success and what it takes. But like what I'd like to find out now, let's move on swiftly. Harmon Dog High Screen, you're the one who brought that to the UK, you know, and how did you find to bring something new like that, that, ooh, that, mm, that lovely taste, we know cookie, and many people will remember um, Harmon Dog Ice Cream back in the days. So how did it come up about that you had a chance to kind of bring it to the market or the UK market? Well, I, I, as I mentioned, I worked for Mars. I then joined Pepsi. I worked internationally. And uh, my boss at Pepsi, a guy called Ove, uh, Sorensen, he was uh, Danish, and um, he was recruited by uh, a company called Grand Metropolitan, which doesn't exist now. It's, it, it, it became Diageo, uh, which is still a public company in the UK. Um, they bought Pillsbury, which is a company which the uh, your older viewers might remember, not, not so much your younger viewers. And haagen was a brand that they owned. It was uh, based in America. Um, it has this apparently Scandinavian cachet. It was actually started by um, an immigrant pole in New York, uh, okay. and the name was the name was made up to sound uh, Scandinavian. So it was quite a big brand in America. And um, anyway, Ove he was my boss at Pepsi. He left to join Grand Met to run the Hugging Us business, and he recruited me to initially to write a strategy to look at Europe and launching the business in Europe. And um, I spent uh, a year, eighteen months setting up the business, I think 14 different countries in the end, I, I set up the Huggadas business in. And my reward, if that's the right word for it, at the end of that process, uh, was I became managing director of the, the business in the UK and launched the brand in the UK um, in around 1990. So um, I was a very young uh, managing director. I think I was 29 at the time. So it was a big break uh, for me. Um, but it was a fantastic product, you know, that I still eat it today, uh, as my tummy would be a testimony to. Um, and, you know, if I've learned anything in my working life is that uh, great products, uh, if you do even a half decent job um, uh, launching and supporting them, uh, will do fantastically well. And uh, haagen was a was a great product. It is the best ice cream in the world. Um, I said that then and I still believe that now. Well done. Congratulations for, to you and the team. So... It catapulted you, you know, 14 countries and um, bringing it to the UK. Um, 
that catapulted you on to the next level of like making you, yeah, would you say, led to the captain of the industry where people will know it's all the top business people in the world come together, that more business in the, in the UK. So what is it like, that elitist group? Is it, because I mean, my experience with being, being a board director of London 2012, so I know like what it's like when you get top business people in the room. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, very interesting. Now I know why people talk about having that sport mindset. But what was it like for you when you're sitting down, you know, and, 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 you know, coming up with serious topics, obviously it is because um, the topics and the things that you're trying to bring to the table will make a difference. Um, you know, our advisory board, which the prime minister would be, you know, keen to know. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I, um, <clears throat> for me, I, I said I was a you know, managing director in my 20s and it made me realise, um, probably it was only at about that stage of my career, that you know, if I really focused uh, and had an ambition, because I don't think until that point I'd ever really thought about. I always say to young people that the two things I most thought about were um, how I did the job I was doing to the best of my ability at that moment in time, and then when an opportunity came along, you know, grabbing it with both hands, and as opposed to having you know what perhaps was your life journey, which is starting out knowing what you wanted to get, which was in a an Olympic gold medal. I, I didn't, that's not how my life unfolded. Um, it, it, it sort of was more serendipitous, if you like. So I then, I moved, um, I moved sideways. Um, one of the things I realized was that there was no route from being a managing director of a small company to being the chief exec of a very big company or very unlikely to be a route that involved being a chief exec all the way in between. So I moved across the table, as I said earlier, I became um, a buying director at ASDA and did various jobs there and then went to Marks and Spencer's. And then, you know, my big break as a chief exec came in 2004. And the, the thing about Sainsbury's is it's, it's the most public of public companies. And many, many people, you know, there are 120,000 shareholders in Sainsbury's. And for many of them, my mum included, by the way, the first share they ever bought was a Sainsbury share in 1973, when uh, Lord John Sainsbury, who died just recently, uh, floated the Sainsbury's company um, on the stock market uh, and it had as I've mentioned 150,000 employees and at the time I joined around 14 million people shopping in it every week so that's what I mean by the most public of public companies yes you could buy the shares but also we were really very much part of the uh, uh, the fabric if you like of our country and so as chief executive you have the authority of all of that so you know what I found was you mentioned that I um ended up on the Prime Minister's Business Advisory Board. Um, and yeah. that was not so much, I like to think, because of me, but more because of the fact that I was able to speak for that very broad church of people. And the reality is when you're the Prime Minister, David Cameron, as it was then, um, you have all the same problems we talked about earlier. You're shut yeah. off from the real world that you're trying to make uh, decisions in. And that's part of in our that, problem oh. with political in a cocoon, yeah, and that's, and you know, all of the debate we're having about number 10 at the moment is part of that cocoon debate. And of course, if you're in a cocoon, you'll make worse decisions. You, you will make worse decisions. So that was my opportunity. And so, you know, there is, there's a sort of unofficial club called, you know, big company chief executive. It doesn't really exist, but you sort of end up in the same meetings, the same events, the same charity dues. Um, you know, lots of other chief executives sitting around that table in the Prime Minister's Advisory uh, Committee. But I always thought the point of difference I had uh, was that I worked in a business that had that reach. So I was, if you like, closer to the coalface than most. But also that was my personal life journey. You know, I was a reasonably rare beast. I, I uh, went to state school. Um, uh, I almost didn't go to, to university. I, was, uh, I went to a sixth form college rather than uh, a, a university of Bath, is that right? Well, then I went to the University of Bath. I, I sort of only really went there because the sport was great. I mean, one of the things we might touch on is that I, I consider myself a sort of failed sportsman. I'd much, I'd much prefer to uh, have done what you did than what I did. You know, I sort of, I, I, I um, lacked the talent uh, to great sporting success, but my competitive drive uh, came through in my business uh, life. Um, but, yeah. you know, I, I was quite unusual as a chief exec with that kind of back backstory, if you like. Yeah, and that drives what I was saying you because I know what it's like. Because why I asked you that, being on the advisory board with the, you know, 
Prime Minister, we're the top business people in the UK. It's because when I was on the team with the likes of Linda Christie, Colin Jackson, you know, Daley Thompson, there was an energy. So you had the present and the energy of these athletes going out to achieve. Then you had the, the, the pressure of going out there and representing your country and your own personal goals, what you would like to achieve. You're talking about over eight years or four years for something like less than 10 seconds in certain events. And mine, I'd say about three hours. So how do we handle that? To go into a space with all that pressure, knowing if we make that wrong decision or that failure, that we know the pressures. For, for instance, Cristiano Ronaldo, Champions League final, misses a goal that could make them win it. It might get over 100 or let's say 200 million. But when you're talking about you making, <laughs> you know, a mistake, how much money would it cost the whole country? And it could even ricochet to other countries around the world. So are you aware of these kind of pressures? And how, how do you handle it? Is there a routine regime that you do? That Do you read? Do you do yoga? No, 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 no I don't. Look, I, I, I think... Um... I do think there's a contrast. You know, the, the, the reality is, is that if you're in the, the business uh, business life or a political life, there, there truly are not that many moments that are as you know, pivotal in your responsibilities as, you know, lining up to do that 100 metres or that uh, high jump when you've missed the bar twice at a height that you know you can clear easily and you've got a just one shot at uh, getting over it and you make a decision to skip that height and go even higher you know that kind of right. pressure uh, very rarely uh, happens in business and political life I would say you get your know, moments of it you know preparing for a big interview or a big presentation or a big deal that you might be about to negotiate and sign but generally speaking they're much smaller bricks in a much bigger wall I think than would be the case for a sports person certainly I had some experience of the sport vicariously through my son. And, uh, and I can tell you that the, the most nervous moments of my life have been, you know, watching him on starting grids. I mean, I can still sort of feel the feeling I had when he did the uh, Indy 500 a couple of years ago. And when you see 33 cars doing something like 240 miles an hour, um, and, and they're no more than that far apart, and I really do mean that far apart, and they motor across that. Now that felt like quite a big moment. I don't think um, I'd ever felt a moment personally that felt quite as, you know, kind of stunning as that. So I, I think there is a difference. On, the one thing I would say though, is I'm very fortunate in that I, I've always found it relatively easy, if that's the right word, to, to, to wear the responsibility lightly. I, I think that you can let it weigh you down. You, it, and, and clearly for some, um, it, it, it does. Uh, but I always took the view that I performed best when I was as, if you like, as, as relaxed and as dispassionate as possible. And that's something I've, I, I have inside me. You know, I, I've sometimes talked about the fact that I, uh, I have an off button. You know, I, I can come home, I can switch off the second I walk through the door. And when my head hits the pillow, I go to sleep. And I'm, I'm kind of very fortunate, I think, in that regard. Wow, <laughs> I've had to earn that to learn how to sleep because the pressures of like a bad competition or a great competition, I was either so stressed that I couldn't sleep or I was so much on a high. So, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> no, I think, it, it, you know, it, I'm just fortunate that's my wiring. Um, and fortunate that's my wiring, I guess. Yeah. I mean, now um, you had a great career. You're a product of your journey in life. And, you know, um, learning from inside the box, outside the box, great grounding, and your records speak for itself. In life now, and you, you seem that you still got that fire in your eyes, is there something that you're looking forward to achieve now? What, 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 what drives you now? Is there anything that you'd like to achieve? Well, lots of things. I've always been a bit of a butterfly. I mean, one of the things why retail was so great for me was that it, 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 it's got so much breadth to it you know you, there's so many interesting aspects uh, to the job and I, I'm not someone that's great and this is perhaps why um, sport would not have been my thing that can and put the blinkers on and and go after one uh, single thing and and uh, one of the joys uh, since I've left um, 
uh, Sainsbury's is the variety of things I've been able to get involved in. Um, you know, a, 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 an abiding passion for me throughout my life has been uh, sport. Um, you know, I, I, I'll watch a game of tiddlywinks. I, you know, I, I, I love sport. Um, but I'm particularly passionate about the fact that sport, um, nothing actually, I don't believe, you know, even education, nothing is more powerful at helping young people with their life journeys than sport. I, I, I really believe that. And you look at my track record at Sainsbury's, we created active kids in my time at Sainsbury's that put over a hundred million pounds worth of uh, sport and activity and equipment into schools in, the, in this country. We sponsored uh, the Youth Sport Trust, the uh, Youth uh, Games, amongst uh, other things. And of course, very famously got involved in the Paralympics as well. Uh, and for me, um, it was all about uh, talking to a narrative of opportunity, because I think that uh, that's what we were doing, you know, as a, as a grassroots retailing uh, business. And I've taken that passion on to my post saint this life. So I founded with Keith Mills, um, uh, Anthony Joshua, Prince Harry um, and others, a charity called Made by Sport uh, about three years ago. And it's a charity that champions the role that sport can play in uh, young people's lives. Um, and so that's one of the many things I do today. I actually have involvement in about a dozen companies, some that you will have heard of. I'm a director of Marks and Spencers. I'm a director of PwC, the biggest accounting firm in the UK. But most you won't have heard of. Um, uh, uh, most of my time is spent uh, guiding, helping, mentoring um, young, younger at least, because I still consider myself uh, young, although most won't, um, uh, business people on their, their business journeys. So um, I, uh, I have a very busy life, but very varied. Yeah, great. I mean, my youngest daughter, Eden Grant, she's an up and coming model. Fingers crossed that she'll go out there. She's for me. She's going out there doing what she loves. So she, to she do. didn't. She didn't get that from her dad then. Clearly, no, she didn't. <laughs> she was on <laughs> London Fashion Show. So we, she did. Uh, yeah, work for a few fashion companies. And so yeah, fingers crossed for her. But what I I, I, I love the things that you've done, and I commend you on that. A round of applause. Um, is what I'm passionate about now. Coming from you know the part of London. Um, the struggles and the pressures that I had to become successful. I'm very hands-on. So the Dalton Wright Academy, people see me in the park training because we didn't have any facilities. So I quite like going back, you know, and passing back my knowledge and being hands-on. And it's so funny how I've got people in the park and I've got a young guy, Alex, who just got called up for the under 20s rugby. Hopefully that he goes on to the Six Nations. Leila Hubbard, who's 15, that call up for England and she actually trains with Arsenal ladies under 21 and she's only 15. So there's people that, you know, former, you know, teammates, um, Francis Adjipong and Mary Berkeley, who's a long jump, one was a chicken jumper, but they're married and their sons, one place at Chelsea, Jeremiah and Jacob, he was, you know, at Crystal Palace and now he's playing, um, I think, league, league for, is it league? I'm not yeah. sure, but then, uh, you know, got a professional career. So these are the people that I work with. And it's nice when you can give back. The rewarding thing is, is when you can pass back your knowledge. It's not about, you know, everybody being like Dalton Grant. It's like taking something from me and that can stamp that, um, that, 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 that quality or work ethic, the mindset to make you achieve what you want to achieve in life. So we've got that in common. Who knows? We might cross yeah. paths in the future. Well, look, but that, to that yeah. last point you made, to that last point you made, Dawn, I think it's a really important point because, um, you know, there are, you know, there's only one Dawn Grant, there's only one Justin King, I like uh, to think. Um, and, and what's important about our life journeys and those great young people that you've just mentioned is that, of course, they're fantastic stories for those individuals and, and we wish them every success, but they hopefully inspire other young people too. Not necessarily to the same level of success because, you know, we all know that pyramid gets very small and very few people get to the top. But all of the lessons that you learn are part of that are important to whatever your life journey uh, turns out to be. I, I, I One of the things I do, there's a uh, a charity called Speakers for Schools that encourages business people like me to go into schools and, and talk about their life journey. Um, I only go to state schools to do those speeches because, you know, I'm a state school kid. 
And all I do is tell my life journey, you know, that I was um, then once there's a story that I tell when I left Sainsbury's, uh, although I didn't consider it was I was retiring, the, the, the headline on the Birmingham Evening Mail, I was born in the East End of London, but brought up in Birmingham. And the headline on the Birmingham Evening Mail, which my mum was very proud of, said former Birmingham Evening Mail paperboy retires because my 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 journey, my work journey started out as a paperboy for the Birmingham Evening Mail. And I think that it's incredibly important that young people understand that the more effort they put in, the more they'll get out of life. And when I do those talks in schools, every single one, I'll get a handful of kids come up to me afterwards and say, I never thought someone like you could get to the position that you got to. And that what does that mean for me? What might I be able to achieve? And that, to me, is the greatest gift that those of us that are successful to give to young people, the, the opportunity to realise their full potential, whatever that full potential might be. That's right. Well, what can I say? Thank you so much. I believe the missing link is that you need to have that personality behind the camera. And sometimes we've got characters, you know, in sport that have got great people skills and can easily inspire people from how they are. Um, I think there's a lot of people who's on the team, like what I know is quiet. And if you're not a creative person, don't try and be creative. Stick to what you know, because there's not fools at the top. That's what I say. But on that note, I'd like to say Justin King, CBE, thank you so much for... Thank you. you know, yeah, for accepting um, this interview. And may you go on and achieve many more success successes or whatever you want to do at the highest level in your life and enjoy it and always be happy and do it with a smile as I know you would on your face. So on that yeah, note, do you know that, say, that's such you. good advice, Dalton. If nothing else, do what you enjoy because whatever you enjoy, you will do better. So that's I always right. say that. Do what you enjoy and you'll do it better. Thank you. Thank you. Dalton Grant Academy. Work ethic. Mentally strong. Positive mindset. World-class foundation, elite athletes, youth, never give up. A talented coach, meeting talented athletes equals success. Championing the making, no pain, no gain. Bringing new levels to the table. Learning about the standard as words versus physicality. Warriors teaching warriors.